Hello everybody, uh, this is a supplementary video on invertible functions for uh, our modern algebra class. Uh, so uh, we have talked a lot in class about functions and uh, gave uh, all sorts of different properties of them. Uh, one that we didn't get to was invertibility, so uh, that's what we're going to talk about here. Let me quickly recall something. So if I have uh, a set, just any set, so if S is a set, um, then there's always this really nice function from the set to itself. All right, no matter what the set is, we can write down this function. Then there exists a map, which uh, we're identifying right now, or we're calling IDS, which was the identity map from the set to itself. And what does that map do? Well, if you have an element little x in S, it just gets mapped to itself. All right, so nothing, nothing happens to it. Okay, so this is called the identity map on S. Oh, I should say you know, map or function, whatever. Um, we say map or function on S. All right. Um, so uh, let's make the situation now a little more complicated. So let's say um, we're going to have two sets, S and T. All right. So uh, now we're going to assume we have some function that goes from S to T. So, so a function F from S to T. We're going to say that it's invertible. Okay, so to invert something is somehow to maybe turn it around, go backward, right? So this function is invertible if there exists a function which goes backward. So we're going to call maybe that function g that goes from t back to s. So it switches the domain and the codomain such that If I compose these two functions, okay, and let me draw a quick picture, show what I, what I mean here. So I have S, and that maps uh, via F to T. And what I could do is now, once I get to T, I could apply the map G, and that will send me back to S. And so I now get a composition function, G composed F. Uh, and so I want that this composition function, g composed f, well, there's another function we have going from s to s, from up above, right? That's the identity function. And there's no reason immediately to think that these should be the same thing, and, and usually they won't be. Uh, but if f is invertible and you pick the right function g, then it might be possible, right, that you have found a composition which is actually equal to the identity function. Okay, well, this is not quite enough. Uh, this is this only works on one side. We actually need to go the other way as well. So I could have started with T and mapped it to S via G. And then once I get to S, I can map back to T via F. And if I do so, again, I get a composition, F composed G. And there's also the identity map, now on T instead of on S. And again... It could be the case that these are the same maps, probably not, but we could get lucky. And if we have it, that in both directions, the composition is the identity map, then we call the function f invertible. All right, so, and in this case, we call g the inverse of f. Okay, and of course, once you know that g is the inverse of f, then of course also f is the inverse of g. Um, common notation. Uh, so commonly we write g equals f to the negative 1. So note, 
this does not equal 1 over f. Uh, this is a little bit problematic because uh, this notation f to the negative 1 is also used for the pre-image of an element under f, uh, which is actually a set. So you just have to be a little bit careful. Uh, but once you know your function is invertible, then usually it, it, it isn't so much of a problem to uh, distinguish. All right, so let's see a, an example. Uh, so let's say I have the function from the real numbers to the real numbers, which sends an element x to its cube root. Right? So this will uh, give us a, a unique answer, right? The cube root of a real number uh, is, is unique. Uh, OK, so um, is this map invertible? Well, if it's going to be invertible, I'm going to need a map which goes backward. So that means I swap the codomain and the domain, but of course they're the same here, so it's going to look the same, r to r. But now the question is, what should I do with this, an element x? Where should it go to? And, well, we know that wherever it goes to, if I then apply f to it, I'm going to take the cube root, and I better get back to x. Okay, so let's draw that here. So I have the real numbers to the real numbers, to the real numbers, and I know I have this g, and it's going to send x to something, right? Who knows what it is? Question mark. But then I have this f, which is going to take the cube root. So this question mark will go to the cube root of the question mark. Okay. On the other hand, I want I want to have the identity on r as this composition, right? Well, where would the identity send x? The identity would send x just to x, because it's the identity. So this tells me these have to be equal. So the cube root of question mark has to equal x. All right, well, let's cube both sides. Then I get question mark equals x cubed. Ah, and so this tells me what my g should do. It should send x to x cubed. All right, so we can see here that if we do the composition, f compose g, and we evaluate it at x, we're going to get f of, we'll see, g of x is x cubed. And now we take the cube root of x cubed, and that will be x, which is equal to what we would get if we'd applied the identity map to x. All right, and so we conclude that f compose g is equal to the identity map Oops, the identity map on R. Okay, of course, we need the other direction as well. So let's check what happens when we compose the other direction. So first, I take f of x, which will be the cube root of x. Now I apply g, which will cube the cube root of x. Well, that's just x, which again is the identity map applied to x. And so once again, we conclude that the composition is equal to the identity map. All right, we'll do one more quick example to show what can go wrong here. So let's say I start now, again, we'll go from the real numbers to the real numbers. But instead of the cube root, I'll take the square root. All right, well, OK, immediately you see there's going to be a, um, a problem. Um, uh, because you can't take the square root of negative numbers. So, okay, fine, let's adjust, and we'll just look at the non-negative real numbers. Okay, fine. Okay, so let's see now. Um, I need a function which undoes this, and it seems pretty reasonable from what we did up above that if I'm going to define a function g, from the reals to the, uh, the non-negative reals, that I should be undoing the square root, which I should be doing by squaring. All right, so this is my guess, right? So guess for the inverse. OK, so let's try. So let's do f compose g. 
and apply it to some x. So when I, I take some uh, g and I square it, let's see, I'll get f of x squared. All right, then I apply f to x squared, and it's going to take the square root. And let's write this out. So I take the square root of x squared. And here's how where we have a little bit of a problem. Consider something like the square root of 36, which is the square root of 6 squared. We know that the square root of 36 is equal to 6. Right? We always get the positive uh, square root when we use this symbol. Okay. On the other hand, if I took negative 6 squared, this would also, and I took the square root, I would also have the square root of 36, which is 6. So whether I start with a 6 or a negative 6, my answer when I square and then take the square root is 6. So this actually gives me the absolute value of x, right? If it was 6 or negative 6, it's going to spit out 6. But this is not always equal to x. So this is not equal to x when x is negative. And so g is not an inverse. So g is not an inverse for f. Okay? And in fact, you're not going to be able to get an inverse for f in this case. Okay, so uh, this is a, what you're going to need to work on. Um, there's a proof you're going to do, and I'll write the theorem out here. Uh, later on, I'll post a video completing this, this theorem, but I, I want you guys to work on it first. Um, so a function f from s to t is invertible. if and only if f is a bijection. So remember, a bijection was an injective and surjective map. Okay, so this is the connection. Really, we, we talk about bijective and we talk about invertible functions. We're actually talking about the same thing. Okay, so another video. I'll prove it, but in the meantime, I want you guys to work on that.